Um, hey, um, good evening to everyone here. Um, glad you guys joined. I think there's a bunch of people still joining, so we take it slow the first couple of minutes and then dive into it. Um, the session today is about biohacking, right? Specifically about biohacking for non-billionaires. You might have heard about Brian Johnson, the billionaire who's spending potentially hundreds of millions in extending his lifespan, right? Most of us can't afford that, but um, there's a lot of stuff we can do as well at our level to improve it. So um, how the session is going to go is I'm going to make sure it's as interactive as possible, right? Because I would love for you guys to tell me what you want to know and what you already do know so that we can add to our learning experience. So um, you can put in responses in the chat itself, right? And if at any point you have a question or a query, you can add that to the chat as well, right? And we'll address all questions at the end of it. We'll have a Q&A session when we talk about all the questions you guys have got. And um, if you've got any questions that are private or personal, I guess you know you can reach out separately. But uh, you should be able to do this, uh, share pretty okay on this. So the first question that I'd ask you guys is, what is biohacking, right? And keep in mind, you can put in whatever answer you want. The whole point is that we're here to learn. So what, do you, what according to you is biohacking? Just put your responses in the chat, right? Okay, I'll give you I'll give you one of the answers that um, you know I've sort of got. Stop aging, pretty cool. Here's the sort of long version answer. Okay, biological investigation of holistic adaptations and clinical knowledge for increasing natural growth. Right, got an answer that says be able to make changes naturally. So all this was was um, basically coming up with a backronym for biohacking. Right, why hacking might be about knowing your body and using the body mechanism towards your benefit. Absolutely, optimizing body functions to be most productive and efficient. Okay, so this is interesting, right? I'm I'm seeing um, online also why we're having this session is because there's a lot of misinformation out there about uh, wellness and health. Right, a lot of times people who aren't qualified make a lot of claims. We'd like to fix that, right? So we we see words such as efficient. We see words such as optimization. We see words such as improvement, productivity, things like that. The problem with these words is it's extremely hard to come up with one specific scale or one specific sort of system which you can apply to every human on the planet to measure these metrics, right? So I would say the moment someone tells you that this is a biohack anyone can use, you stop them right there because that's not true. Right, personalization and individual customization is key to all aspects of medicine. The most popular medicine right now, the field that has the most research is personalized medicine. Right, that's for a good reason. I see someone's talked about aging like a fine wine. Absolutely, right. As of now, what science tells us is that aging cannot be stopped, but you can have positive outcomes with it. Okay, so yeah, so I would say that biohacking is the number of incremental changes you make, right, in order to improve your mind, your body, your productivity in terms of work, right, anything you want. But it's small incremental changes. That is that is the key component over there, right? So what we're going to talk about today is we first go through the top 10 biohacks. So I've gone through social media. I've used AI to compile a list of the most common biohacks out there. Then we'll talk about whether they're legitimate or not. Then we'll talk about science-based biohacks, right? We'll talk about um, how you can make easy changes to your diet. We'll talk a little bit about exercise. Unfortunately, we have to. Then we'll be talking about mental health and um, how, how to take care of your own mental health. Then we'll do a little bit more about myth busting as well. Okay. So, yeah. So we've got um, biohacking. So we talk about nutrition optimization. A lot of people talk about this. Intermittent fasting. Okay. Uh, a lot of people talk about intermittent fasting. High intensity intermittent training, HIIT, done in gyms all the time. Cold therapy. 
this has become super popular these days, right? You have all the cold showers and ice baths, things like that. Sleep optimization. I would say that this is a biohack everyone should do, okay? Because it's always important to get enough sleep and it's very underrepresented as well. We need to talk about mindfulness and meditation as well. Uh, mental health, essential to that. Supplementation. This needs a lot. I, I We need to go in-depth into this because you don't just buy whatever an influencer tells you to because it's packaged really well, right? You need to understand what your body needs. Infrared light therapy also coming up. People talk about the quantified self, right? So it's basically creating a digital twin of yourself, which comprises all the parameters that make you. So for example, a very basic version of it would be when you do your annual medical checkup, right? You are essentially, if you've seen the health reports that come from various brands these days, they'll have a human and they'll point to various parts of the body with a score that they've assigned, right? For your thyroid, for your uh, heart health, for your sexual wellness, for your gut health, right? So that's basically your digital twin with those numbers representative of the scores you want. So you quantified yourself using other scores, right? Then a lot about neurofeedback. Neurofeedback, there are things as um, experimental and uh, in use in India, for example, uh, Maven Health has a thing called uh, the transcranial stimulation device for depression. And you also have really simple neurofeedback mechanisms like literally just your alarm clock, right? It is essentially neurofeedback to wake you up, okay? My advice to you would be, if you're making a change that is affecting your health, it's a good idea to speak with a healthcare professional, right? It could be your family doctor, it could be your primary care provider, it could be a specialist who's seeing you because say you have diabetes or hypothyroidism. Speak to them because you might not be aware of the impact this might have on any pre-existing diseases or on disease risks, right? So even if it's a doctor on social media saying, do X, Y, Z, for example, right now I tell you, you know, tomorrow onwards, I want all of you to start taking magnesium supplements. Don't take me at my word, right? Ask me for evidence. One, me itself, right? Ask me for evidence. Two, you should have the necessary skills to go through that evidence and see if it's legitimate or not. Right? We'll go through that a little bit as well. Once you're done with that, if you still don't have clarity or it seems like the evidence is sort of iffy, speak to a healthcare provider you know. Like I said, your family doctor, someone who's known you for years, right? Or maybe through telehealth at plan, you reach out to a primary care physician and say, hey, I've got this advice, is it legit or not? Right? Well, over there you'll get honest advice because suppose right now I'm telling you to take a bunch of magnesium supplements, I might be getting profit from that, right? I might have tied up with a magnesium brand or a supplement company and that might be my incentive for pushing this, right? Whereas on the other hand, the third party that you speak to, your family physician, has no incentive to peddle magnesium to you, right? If they feel like, okay, maybe this is beneficial to you, I have read some literature that says that it works, then they'll convey that to you, right? So that's the problem when it's just a, you know, I push something to you and you take it, versus getting a third person's objective opinion, right? The third person's objective opinion can be an actual person or literally just scientific literature, right? So... Yeah, these are all the things we talked about. Um, well, when we talk about biohacking, we also have to talk about health versus disease, right? Because you see that most biohacks are not for disease states, right? There is no biohack for diabetes. No one tells someone that if you have diabetes, check this out. This is going to, you know, make sure that you don't need insulin. No, no one says that, right? The most biohacks are here's how to reduce your risk of diabetes, right? Or here's how to lose weight. Or here's how to feel, how to gain muscle. Stuff like that. So biohacks normally focus on wellness, right? Rather than disease. Which is not a bad thing, right? And prevention is the most important aspect of healthcare because it has an impact on a global level. So you have to understand that biohacking is more towards maintaining health and improving wellness rather than treating disease. And this is super important to know that health is not just the absence of disease, right? Which is why we're talking about biohacking. Preventive care is extremely important, right? Especially if you have risk factors for disease. Now, um, can someone tell me about risk factors? So let's say, what are the types of risk factors you know of, right? Just give me some risk factors and examples. You can put it in chat, right? I was really happy to see the response in the, to the previous question. 
would be lovely if you guys can um, continue that, right? So what, what are the risk factors for diseases that you know about? It can be for any disease, right? It can be for cancers, it can be for diabetes, it can be for hypertension, which is high blood pressure. It can be for infections like COVID-19. Just let me know what are the kind of risk factors you know about. This is important because there are ways to optimize for reducing risk factors as well. Okay, we've got cholesterol. Um, okay, obesity. Okay, yeah, absolutely. A lot of lifestyle diseases associated with obesity. Smoking. I think perhaps there is. You would be hard pressed to find a cancer which is not associated with smoking, right? Okay, HbA1c. So inflammation, hereditary. Very important. Genetic risk factors. I would say genetic risk factors are important because you need to know about it. Um, and there's not much that you can do about it, right? Which is why you have to take care of all the other risk factors, right? Environmental risk factors, extremely important. Stress, again, linked to so many diseases from diabetes to depression, right? Adulteration, uh, again, yeah, uh, food. Microplastics are coming into mainstream media now as uh, a major source of issues in uh, pretty much every health system. Poor diet, okay. Thank you guys so much. That makes a lot of sense. So, yeah, now we talk about the purpose of biohacking, which is wellness, right? So we'll give examples, right? We've all heard of uh, CGM, which is continuous glucose monitors, right? Those patches you put on your arm, and then you see your response to certain foods after you eat them, right? Do you know what it was developed for? Um, it was actually developed for type 1 diabetics, right? Because type 1 diabetics need to know exactly how much insulin they need from the insulin pump, right? Because in type 1 diabetes, you are insulin dependent from the start. If you don't get enough insulin, you will literally die, right? So type 1 diabetics needed continuous glucose monitoring in order to understand how much insulin need to be released into their blood, okay? It was not developed for humans to use for wellness, right? It was developed for type 1 diabetics. Currently, it's used by athletes and fitness enthusiasts to see how their body reacts to food okay then we talked about infrared and phototherapy so does anyone know what this was developed for um uh, phototherapy uv light related was developed for jaundiced babies right it's used in the neonatal ic you might have seen the blue light in uh, neonatal icus infrared light therapy was developed for musculoskeletal injuries right it's used in physiotherapy a lot these days right? the original technology was developed for hatching eggs right pretty basic the quantified self. So the quantified self, again, uh, was is a relatively new concept, right? It was developed in order to make digital twins for research purposes, not for biohacking. Okay. Sleep optimization techniques. So this is interesting. A lot of the sleep optimization techniques you come across, right, which might be breathing techniques like square breathing or, uh, um, you know, focused sleep approaches. All of these were usually developed by soldiers. Right? Because in military environments, it's super important that you're able to sleep fast and get good quality sleep whenever you can. So most of the sleep optimization techniques, especially for initiating sleep, were actually developed by various militaries across the planet. Then neurofeedback. Um, neurofeedback was mostly developed in order for patients to deal with uh, psychiatric issues. You've got things like PTSD, where neurofeedback techniques were developed in order to help patients feel better. Right? They combine cognitive behavioral therapy with neurofeedback. It's a variant of biofeedback. But again, currently it's used by a bunch of athletes and fitness freaks. Right, But it's not a bad thing right? that the technology was initially developed for one purpose and is being used for something else. That is not a bad thing. You've got lots of examples of that in medicine. right? The common example which is given is uh, minoxidil, which is used for hair loss. Right? Originally, it was developed as a medication for hypertension, right? But people notice that it's great for hair loss. And now, minoxidil is used exclusively for hair growth in, in case of hair loss, right? So just because something comes from somewhere doesn't mean we can't apply it in our way use, right? That's, that's fine. But the problem which comes with biohacking is that you need to look at these interventions from a public health perspective as well. Right? You have to look at how things are economically feasible. right? Like I said, not everyone is Brian Johnson. Not all of us can have a machine that stimulates our abdominal muscles 1,000 times merely to develop them or have um, you know, plasma 
plasma transfusions from our children, right? It's not feasible for everyone. So we need to look at things from a feasibility and scalability perspective. Feasibility, I'm talking about cost economics. Scalability, can everyone do this, right? Like I talked about, the personalization aspect of things is important. So how do we go about this, right? Like from what I just said, it sounds like biohacking is pretty impossible, right? It needs to be cheap, it needs to be scalable, it needs to be something which is personalized to everyone. All these things can't go hand in hand, but they actually can, right? That's what we're going to look at. We'll talk about a few universally applicable ways in which you can optimize your health, right? And we need to figure out a, a surefire way that you guys can understand and look at all biohacks from the same perspective that I talked about, right? So the next time you see a social media influencer saying, hey, you know, drink this and your hair loss will stop, you're able to say, pause, okay, is this scientifically viable? If yes, where is the data for it? If no, stop right there. You can ignore it completely, right? If the science is not there, it doesn't work, okay? Second thing, feasibility. You look at the economics, right? If the science works where the thing costs, like let's say a thousand rupees per dose, I don't think it's worth it unless it's a life-saving medication, right? And then outcomes. So what does it do? It promises to do X, Y, Z. But then you look at the study and says that actually it doesn't make hair grow back. It actually stops hair loss. You know, it's two very different things, very important science communication. So a lot of this, I'm sure things like you guys being educated folks, and professionals are greater. Okay. So whether it's marketing or economics, I think you guys can figure that out really well, right? The economics and scale aspect of things. What I think I would be able to help you guys out more with is the science verification, right? And the outcome verification. So because that's something you wouldn't be aware of unless you had training in it, right? Just like I don't have any knowledge of marketing and economics, you guys might not be the most qualified to talk about how well the science or clinical evidence for something is valid, right? Which is what we're here to fix. So yeah, how do you figure things out? So first thing you look at, is it just an expert who's endorsing it, right? Um, an example of this would be, let's say a famous gastroenterologist, okay? Which is a doctor of the abdominal, I mean, the gastrointestinal system, right? Which is basically your alimentary canal, your mouth, your stomach, your intestine, all those things. So if a gastroenterologist is endorsing, let's say, a probiotic supplement, right? Um, why is the gastroenterologist endorsing the supplement? You need to think about that. One, sure, they might believe that it works. But two, let's make no mistake, they're being paid for it, right? So the moment you're accepting financial gain in order to promote a product, right, which is something which is a big issue in the medical industry, then it's no longer secure that your motivation to promote that product is, you know, purely uh, scientific or for the gain of everyone involved, right? So you need to question whether this person might be getting paid for it. It's the first question you ask. If yes, you know, the value of the endorsement does decrease. Two, whatever product you're looking at, right, whether it's uh, ice baths, whether it's probiotic supplements, whether it's magnesium supplements, whether it's some kind of nootropic stack, you need to figure out whether the study that is a, a controlled, randomized controlled study that was done to show its effects. One, was a study done? If no, then ignore it. It's not real, right? If a study was done, where was the study published, right? So in all clinical research, once you do the research, you publish it in a journal, right? And you can very easily go online and see the quality of a journal, right? You have certain statistics that you go into it such as um, the, uh, which places the journals are indexed in, right? As well as a citation index that the journal has. So very easy to go online. And uh, this is where AI can be used for good, right? You can ask ChatGPT. You can copy a complex looking study or paper, put it into ChatGPT and say, please simplify this for me and tell me, does this thing work? ChatGPT will go through it and tell you that, okay, based on the results, it shows that, for example, this medication reduces blood sugar by 20%. Right? There's clear evidence that it works. Use AI for good, right? The free version of ChatGPT 4 that's available is more than good enough to do a simple analysis of an abstract of a journal, right? You would also like, need to look at is that, is this study blinded or controlled, okay? So blinding of a study means 
both the researchers and the people in it don't under, don't know whether they were getting the real deal or a placebo right control means you're comparing everything right in that study with another arm which is not getting the substance right so one placebo one real right like i said we imposed abstracts or papers on chat gpt and asked it to simplify it right and you can ask it whether it is good enough to formulate clinical recommendations okay remember not to use biased questions it shouldn't be something like hey this thing that i think works does it work right it should be please go through this abstract and convey to me whether this is clinically valid evidence okay so this is levels of evidence right i, I told you i talk about this you guys don't need to remember all of this all you need to remember is level 1 right if something doesn't have a systematic review or meta analysis which is a study that looks at a bunch of randomized control trials or if it doesn't have a high quality randomized control trial then you shouldn't incorporate it into your life it's as simple as that if something isn't level 1 on this don't do it because you're literally dealing with your life when you talk about health okay remember we talked about risk factors right so risk factors are two types you guys mentioned pretty much everything from both sides right modifiable risk factors include things like obesity that you talked about right um exercise diet some talk about nutrition smoking was also mentioned alcohol consumption again associated with so many cancers and things like that right and uh, stress again clearly mentioned by other people lack of sleep you guys mentioned that as well so these are all modifiable you can change it right then you guys also talked about things you couldn't change like your genetics right family history genetics comorbidities comorbidity is a disease that you already have right like for example if you've got diabetes and um, now you're wondering what your risk of hypertension is having diabetes increases your risk of hypertension right so these are two types of risk factors how do you deal with non modifiable risk factors this is biohacking all right so like i said um it's important that you know about them most people i was surprised at how little people know about them so in the family history so most people don't even bother to find out for example what did your grandparents pass away from or your great grandparents pass away from right how many people in your family have had a history of cancer how many people in your family have diabetes being vaguely aware of it is different from actually quantifying when you find out that 50% of the women in your family have diabetes or hypothyroidism and you're female you know that your risk of having that is so much higher than someone who doesn't have that family history right and um, it is important to realize that unless it's a genetic disease like very specific things right like thalassemia for example you don't need to do genetic counseling right? and genetic counseling is where um suppose you're getting married and plan to have children you evaluate your genetic material and your partner's genetic material to figure out whether what the risk of your child having a disease is right like i said huge number of genetic diseases out there we can't do it for all of them so unless you're aware of a risk in your family it's not required right and a simple example of this is um basically if you have um a positive blood group right and your wife has a negative blood group there is a risk of something called erythroblastosis fetalis right which is where your child has um a negative blood group and has issues as well right very rare these days because your organ checks for it right but this is just an example of it. then you talk about things like brca uh, this is something most people tend to know these days because we've got famous people like angelina jolie who got a mastectomy done because there was a brca gene so it increases your risk of breast cancer right tb53 is a gene that prevents cancer so if it's not there risk of cancer increases bard one uh, another example of a gene for cancer right so if you have a history of these things in your family then you need to be more active with cancer screening right very simple obvious thing but surprising how people don't deal with it alcohol another modifiable risk factor right um alcohol can cause liver disease artery disease vitamin deficiencies right a lot of b12 deficiency b1 deficiency as well um so we've heard this thing that 14 units of alcohol is okay for a man to have right and 10 to 14 for women to have and we hear things like it has to be spread out over 5 days and you need to make sure you have at least a couple of days free of alcohol per week right but the truth is that 
the WHO has clearly stated there is no safe level of alcohol. So avoiding it as much as you can is the best way to go about it, right? And if you end up having alcohol, please definitely avoid binge drinking. Binge drinking is defined as more than four units of alcohol. Like one unit of alcohol is equal to either 30 ml of hard liquor or one beer, right? We can't talk about biohacking without talking about smoking, right? Uh, a lot of people I know have switched from smoking cigarettes to e-cigarettes. I would definitely say it's a positive step, but unfortunately, e-cigarettes carry their own risk, right? Like smoking increases your risk of heart disease and lung cancer. E-cigarettes increase your risk of uh, certain things like popcorn lung, right? Which is basically where your lung is collapsing uh, due to fibrosis, right? So keep that in mind and avoid smoking as much as possible because most people don't understand that smoking kills through um, heart disease, right? So four times the number of people who die from smoking actually die from heart disease when compared to lung cancer. And you guys already know how common lung cancer is in smoking. Just imagine how common heart disease is in smokers, right? And remember that um, you don't have to quit instantly, right? You need to reduce, you need to seek help if required, and uh, you don't just have to rely on government patches. There are medications like varaniclin and bupropion, which help you quit smoking as well. Right? Your psychiatrist will prescribe that for you. Uh, yeah, so this was drinking. We talked about units of alcohol, right? So you need to be aware of how many units of alcohol you're taking in. This is, this is biohacking 101, guys. It's not just five beers. It's actually... Um, three units into five, you're actually taking 15 units of alcohol, right? So quantifying alcohol helps you understand what your risk is, right? Um, one glass of wine is two units, one can of beer is two units, right? And one shot of hard alcohol is one unit. So simple thing to keep in mind. Like I said, ideally zero units per week is the best place to be at. But if you can reduce it, try to go to below 14 units per week just because of the old guidelines. Right? Yeah. So in case you didn't believe me, the WHO has actually come out and said that no level of alcohol is safe for your health. Right? So all the old things of 14 units per week, not valid. Ideally be a teetotaler. Right? We People talked about diet. Okay. So what are some dietary biohacking tips that you guys can give me? Right? Um, I'd love to get, get your feedback on dietary biohacks. Because this is something that a lot of people have been seeing, right? People talk about white rice a lot. People talk about don't leave white rice outside or in the fridge. People talk about how, uh, I think there's something about freezing white rice or making it cold and then cooking it to change the starch in it, things like that, right? So please, I want you guys to share your uh, nutrition biohacks with me. And I will then show you what I have, which is very basic stuff, right? So yeah, please. Um, um, drinking water whenever you feel like eating junk. Okay, that's very interesting. Um, I guess I guess it makes sense. It might give you a sense of fullness, which works. Low sugar, low refined flour, uh, frozen food, outside food. So I think reduce all of these. I would say out of that, low sugar and low refined flour is always a good idea. Low outside food, also a good idea usually because outside food just usually has a bunch of oil in it. Um, frozen foods... There's no harm in frozen foods, right? In fact, frozen foods are a great way to preserve vegetables longer. So there's nothing wrong with using frozen carrots and frozen peas if you can't get access to the real deal. If you can get access to the real deal, sure. But frozen food is just a low cost, low effort way of getting your vegetables in. Avoid white sugar and white bread. Um, yeah, I think avoiding processed foods is always a good idea. Have two to three portion of fruits during the day. Great advice. I mean, fruits are great for you. They've got fiber, they've got vitamins, they've got good sugars, right? Nuts to feel full for longer. Good idea. Rich foods, foods which have fats in them or proteins in them are usually good at making you feel full longer. If you're vegetarian, this includes things like nuts. If you're non-vegetarian, then meat and eggs are a good source as well. Black coffee instead of milk tea, also a good idea usually. Salad before meal, great idea just because you get your uh, fiber in Drink probiotics, avoid fruit juices. Oh, yeah, avoiding fruit juices is a great suggestion. Uh, just because the packaged fruit juices you get 
usually have much higher sugar than something like coke right I, i'm not sure if you guys have actually read the labels but 100 ml of a fruit juice would have almost two times the amount of sugar as coke which is crazy and but somehow fruit juice is seen as healthy right okay so let's give me like a proper answer eat less than your maintenance calories 1 to 2 grams protein per kg of body weight eat millets avoid wheat at night gluten at night fruits in the morning decrease sugar decrease avoid preserved foods um not of this looks like good advice fresh fruit made at home see so fresh fruit juice is fine right you know what went into it so for example when you say orange juice it's literally just putting an orange in a machine and pulping it and you drink the juice when say x company like freer says fruit orange juice they mean squeeze that juice add some pectinase to it add a bunch of preservatives add some color add like two times the amount of sugar naturally found in oranges uh preservatives to stabilize it for shelf life and then sell it to you right i don't think you'll be doing that at home so that's good so i see a bunch of questions don't worry i'll answer the questions in the end right okay so i'll give you what i'm talking about so what what we found large scale is that human adults are mostly lactose intolerant okay uh, the exception is north india so in north india because of the cow belt we actually have a lot of people are able to tolerate um lactose but most indians in india cannot have more than say 100 to 120 ml of milk right they don't realize it because and it gets lesser by the way as you grow older because in childhood you're able to digest milk because you have something called lactase which is found in your gut right as we grow older we lose this enzyme and we are unable to digest milk okay so try to avoid milk as much as possible someone talked about having black coffee instead of milk tea it's a great way to avoid milk um people talk about gmo being bad for you right so you'll see non gmo seen on our foods there's nothing wrong with genetically modified organisms in fact most of the rice and wheat you eat today are gmos right um india faced a huge crisis when ms swaminathan stepped up into the green revolution we were able to create fortified rice and fortified corn and fortified wheat right with the micronutrients in them it's probably why we're all healthy today right so there's nothing wrong with gmos uh, as long as they've been approved and controlled by the fda or cdso right yeah a lot of people talked about this white wheat flour is bad for you processed flour processed cheese and refined oil sodium benzoate which is preservative and plastics right so avoid having foods packaged in plastics as much as possible right unfortunately we have spread microplastics to a point where it is found in our body studies have shown that microplastics are found in the testicles right which is where the sperm are produced which is why fertility is decreasing it's also shown to be inside the plaques in our heart right so the blocks in our heart have been found to have traces of microplastics in them so it doesn't matter if it's causing it or not it means that it's reached that deep within us so we definitely need to avoid exposure to it um i would recommend avoiding fad diets things like keto carnivore the atkins diet The problem is they'll all work for a few weeks. Then you'll start having vitamin deficiencies. Then you'll start having fatigue, and your gut microbiome will change. It will become bad, right? So keep keep on a check that a slow, sustainable diet is what you need to go for. And I think pretty much everyone talked about low sugar. Um, it's quite simple, right? Um, calories in, calories out. Sugars are quite dense in calories, and also change your gut bacteria to a large extent. So avoid it to maybe one to two spoons a day total, right? Whenever you can, and keep in mind when we talk about vitamin deficiencies, vegetarians actually have a much higher tendency for vitamin B twelve deficiency. So keep that in mind. Try to have more sources of vitamin B twelve in your diet. Similarly, everyone, uh, what our data shows is between eighty to ninety percent of Indians have vitamin D deficiency. Okay, so again, need to have sources of vitamin D as well, right? and again like i said recommendations vary from person to person so if you're a person who feels like okay i don't feel too good when i have for example vegetarian food right you you've been tried to be vegan or vegetarian but you feel weak fatigue when you're doing it it means that your body is not reacting well to it continue having egg continue having meat if you need to and cut down on whatever is causing issues right um someone asked about protein intake so 
I would say a baseline amount for protein is between uh, 0.6 to 1 gram per kilogram of protein, right? This varies from person to person. This is your baseline protein intake, which is required for you to be healthy. If you want to gain muscle, right, um, getting around 1.6 grams of protein per kilogram is a good idea, right? After 1.6 to 2 grams, it's a bit of a plateau, right? So the difference between 1.6 and 2 grams per kilogram isn't a big deal, unless you're a professional bodybuilder. Right? In that case, obviously, you would already know by now what is good for you. Um, carbohydrates. So there's this thing called complex carbohydrates. It's not as complex as it sounds. It's literally just carbohydrates that aren't sugar and broken down. So an example would be plain sugar, not a complex carbohydrate. Rice, not a complex carbohydrate. Atta, kind of a complex carbohydrate. Sweet potatoes, complex carbohydrate. It just means that your body takes a little longer to break these things down. Right, which is a good idea. You'll feel full long. And there's a good way to drink coffee. Okay, I'll show you in the next slide how to do that. And if you've got goals in mind, like weight goals, muscle goals, speak to a professional. It doesn't necessarily have to be a doctor. Speak to a nutritionist, speak to a personal trainer. They can help you understand what your protein requirements are. Right. And the most important thing you should learn is that small changes that you make are extremely important. You can't say that because I can't follow all the biohacking things, all 10 biohacks that have been discussed, I'm not going to start. That is the worst thing you can do. And the thing that most people actually do is that, right? Because you say that, oh, I, I can't have quinoa and chia seeds in the morning because it's not available here. Forget it. I'm not going to start. That's a really silly way of doing things, right? Find a local alternative or compromise on one or two things, provided you're not compromising on eight to nine, right? Small changes are always a good idea. This is called DASH. Um, you might have heard about this. It's a diet against hypertension, basically. So in this, it's a great way to understand what a good diet should look like. Right? So fatty meat, avoid. Full fat dairy, right? Like things like cheese, avoid as much as possible. Sugar sweetened beverages. So keep in mind, sugar sweetened beverages include fruit, packaged fruit juices as well, right? Not just um, soft drinks. Sweets, uh, obviously ice creams, cakes. I'm not saying never have them in your life, right? I'm saying cut down on it, maybe eat one fourth the amount you are right now, right? And sort of make it a cheat meal. And sodium, the most important thing, reduce salt. If you have if you have hypertension, which is high BP, reducing salt is one of the first things your, your doctor will tell you to do. And for good reason, right? It's a really helpful way to reduce your uh, hypertension. Okay, and obviously increase fruits, vegetables, fish, poultry, beans, nuts and seeds. You guys talked a lot about nuts, so you know about it already. Okay. Yeah, how to have coffee. So you have a hormone in your body called cortisol, right? It is it is called a stress hormone, but it is also normally found in your body. It's what helps you wake up. Okay. So the green line is what you need to look at. And you can see that the peak for cortisol is between 7 to 8 a.m., right? Which is when most people wake up in the morning. It can start as, you know, depending if you wake up at 6, then that is when you peak. Because it is a hormone that helps you wake up, right? So if you're waking up at, say, 7 a.m., your cortisol actually reaches the maximum by 8 a.m. You can see what happens after that. After that, your cortisol starts to decrease, right? So when your cortisol starts to decrease, it means your level of alertness will slowly start to come down. And you can see that by around, if you're waking up, say, around 6 o'clock, then by around... 12, your cortisol is actually reduced to less than half of what it was. Okay. So when is the best time to drink coffee? Best time to drink coffee is around one to two hours after waking up. Because like we just discussed, your cortisol level starts to come down one to two hours after you wake up. So as soon as that starts, you can have a good coffee, a black coffee, and you'll find that your productivity is a little better. And for four to six hours after having that coffee, you'll maintain that level of productivity. If you're a working adult, what does it mean? Let's you wake up at seven. You have your coffee at nine. That means for the next six hours, you're good to go. So by around three o'clock, you will notice that, okay, I'm getting a little tired. Your, ideally, your day should end by four to five and you should be get back home by six, right? Because you can see six onwards, your cortisol level sort of bottomed out, right? So avoid having coffee. The counterpart to that is avoid having coffee after this three o'clock, right? Because this 12 to three is sort of an iffy area. If you have it, it's fine. And after three, if you have it, you might find your sleep is affected. Okay. Super simple. 
So what do you have to keep in mind? Coffee to be had one to two hours after you wake up. Okay. And avoid having it after three o'clock. That's it. Super simple. All right. Okay. Exercise. Unfortunately, we have to talk about it. Right. Even though I like being um, a little sedentary myself. Right. So exercise is a great way to look good, get healthy. And again, the same thing of small changes being helpful applies to this also, right? You can't say that, oh, you know what? I don't have access to a gym, so I can't work out. That's nonsense. There's so many bodyweight exercises you can do, right? Some amount of exercise is better than no amount of exercise. The ideal amount of exercise though, thankfully, um, that's already been found out for us by the WHO, 115 minutes per week of moderate intensity exercise is good enough for good health changes, right? What does 150 minutes of exercise mean? Um, it means 30 minutes a day for five days. That's it, right? That's the minimum. You can do more, obviously, right? And what is moderate intensity exercise? Anything equal to walking briskly or jogging, right? So it, it can be in other things. You can be cycling, you can be swimming, but that is the intensity we're talking about, all right? And keep in mind, if you want to lose weight, it's a good idea to lift weights, right? Because it helps you gain muscle, which increases your basal metabolic rate. That is the amount of calories you burn at rest. Okay. And uh, keep in mind, cardiovascular fitness is really helped, really helped by exercise. And then we talked about sleep. Like I said, I think the one thing everyone should work on, unless you know, you've got the perfect sleep already, is sleep. Right? The variability is super important here. My perfect amount of sleep might be seven hours. Yours might be nine hours. Again, so how can you have one person like Brian Johnson tell you that, oh, I sleep eight hours a day, that's the perfect amount. You need to figure out what is the perfect amount for yourself, right? An easy way to do that is on a day when you're sure that you don't have to wake up, you know, at 6 a.m., sleep at your normal time, right? Like let's say your normal time for sleeping is 10, 30, 11. Sleep at that time and see when you wake up in the morning without an alarm, right? That usually tells you that is your required amount of sleep. Okay, and keep that as your baseline sleep and continue from there. And avoid sleeping at different times each day. So you can't sleep at 12 a.m. on weekdays and at 2 a.m. on weekends. That's not a good idea, right? Try to sleep at a similar time each day. Um, melatonin, you might have heard of this supplement called melatonin, which is found over the counter in Indian pharmacies. It's a great supplement. Um, it proves really beneficial, right? Um, taking 2.5 to 3 mg before sleeping, 30 minutes or so before sleeping helps. It's non-addictive, right? And it's not a drug per se. It's a very safe compound to take. Um, exercise and diet is also important for sleep. And if you have excessive sleep, which is the opposite problem we were talking about, right? It's a good idea to get your thyroid checked out and also certain deficiencies like vitamin D deficiency and also sleep quality. Turns out you have uh, insomnia because of which you have daytime sleepiness, right? Or obstructive sleep apnea, which is a disease. We got to talk about mental health when you talk about optimizing, right? So when do you know you need to seek help? I'm going to keep it super short and simple. If you find out you're not able to go throughout your day, okay, you're repeating things, you have intrusive thoughts in your head and head on you don't feel pleasure at things. You have a lack of motivation to get things done. Okay. If people around you tell you that, hey, I feel like you seem more down these days. Okay. If you ever think about self-harm, hurting yourself or suicidal thoughts, right? If you've got delusions or hallucinations, you're thinking or seeing things that aren't there, right? Addiction or dependency can be to anything, right? It can be to marijuana, can be to opioids, uh, can be to stimulants like amphetamines or cocaine. Right? If you find that you've got any dependence or addiction, please, please consult a doctor, right? Uh, for everything else, right, all the other things, lack of motivation, all that we talked about, we can start with a therapist, right? Speak to a therapist, get their opinion. If they feel like you need to see a doctor, they will refer you to a doctor, right? Otherwise, therapists can deal with most things like anxiety, depression, stress. And um, yeah, so just knowing what kind of therapists exist on that. First level, usually, which most people reach out to is a counseling therapist, right? They do therapy, what is known as a psychotherapist. Then you've got a clinical psychologist who is usually trained in a hospital setting as well. So they're able to diagnose things such as major depressive disorder or PTSD, right? And start treatment for those. 
but the only person who's allowed to prescribe medication in this is a psychiatrist right so a psychiatrist is sort of the apex when it comes to dealing with mental health they will prescribe medications if it is required okay um yeah so you have to keep in mind that mental health issues are not always presenting with mental health symptoms they can be things like a stomach ache or body pain right which is a result of a, a depression or anxiety that you might have so keep in mind that if you've got that unexplained body pain which has been going on for a long time and it always starts let's say when a deadline is coming around for work it might be because of mental health issues right in which case just speak to a therapist that's all so this is for your eye if you want to biohack for your eyes this is a super simple thing to do it's called the 2020 rule right you might have heard about it most of us work on our screens for 8 to 10 hours a day fact right what do you need to do okay so for every 20 minutes that you are looking at a screen for 20 seconds look at something that is 20 feet away right so i mean i've been looking at this for 20 minutes so i'm going to look at something that's 20 feet away right i'm going to take my time make sure 20 seconds are done right obviously you should take full 20 seconds uh, other than that there's something called revenge bedtime procrastination it sounds like a mouthful but it's really easy and most of us have actually done it which is the sad part so let's imagine at the end of an office day you get back home you're in bed but you don't fall asleep you're just scrolling reels or you're looking at youtube videos why is that because you feel like throughout the day when i was on the screen i was doing work this is my time let me relax chill out by doing what i want to do and that's looking at reels or looking at videos that is called revenge bedtime procrastination So that is what is keeping you from sleeping at say 11 and making you stay up till 12:30. You feel like this is my time, let me claim it back, right? It works out in the opposite way. It makes you feel worse because you sleep less and it makes it difficult for you to sleep because you've been exposed to screens just before sleep. Try to avoid that as much as possible. You got the weekends for that, right? And apart from that, obviously um orthopedic stuff, um try to get a good chair. try to make sure your elbows are on the rest at a 90 degree angle things like that really help out try to make sure you're looking straight ahead at the screen as much as possible right and um, don't sit in the same position for an extended period of time make sure you walk a little bit right every couple of hours get up just go drink some water and walk right very basic stuff but can you imagine all the things we've discussed from start if you put it all together i think it's really hard to imagine that you're not feeling that right I'll uh, just a quick 5 minutes about testing and then we'll have the question answer session. So what all tests should you do in your medical exam? This is biohacking. This is actually biohacking. Get a complete blood count done, right? Get a liver function test done. Get a kidney function test done. For for diabetes get an HbA1c done. All right? Thyroid again, if you're male, I don't think it's essential for you to have a thyroid function test unless you have symptoms. What are the symptoms? feeling tired sleeping a lot reduced libido weight gain feeling cold right if you've got these symptoms might be worth checking your thyroid out if you're female it's a good idea to get thyroid out because females are eight times more likely than males 8x more likely to get hypothyroidism right lipid profile which is your cholesterol in your fats definitely get that done something which a lot of people don't do look at your vitamin b12 and your vitamin d like i talked about if you're vegetarian your b12 deficiency chances are high if you're non vegetarian still your vitamin d risk is high so vitamin d also vitamin d deficiency risk is high right iron profile again this is better for women because anemia is more commonly seen in women so iron profile includes things like ferritin hemoglobin serum iron and transferrin saturation so that will let you know if you got a risk of anemia you won't believe it ladies and gentlemen but even today around 1 in 2 indian women still have anemia okay today in 2024 uh something else which i want to talk about is how just because something is bold in your report okay doesn't mean it's bad for example you see here this 0.53 is highlighted in bold right my patient comes to me this is from a real patient support by the way i removed the name for privacy sake but it's from a real patient support my patient tells me oh my god um doctor this is 0.53 it shows the normal is 0.7 and it's bold is something wrong do i have liver failure liver cancer no absolutely not right this ratio is used by doctors to look at the risk of something 
specifically known as hepatitis B, right? We want to see if it's alcoholic hepatitis or hepatitis B. We look at something called an SGOT IGP2 ratio. It has no value to a patient who's just done it as part of a, an, an annual medical exam, right? Just because it's come out to be less. Okay. So this is why maybe speak with your family physician or primary care doctor whenever you get these tests done, just so you have a better understanding of what it means. Just because it's bold does not mean it's bad. Okay. Now let's talk about a few myths and we'll see whether you guys have figured out whether they're real or not. Okay. So I'm going to, they might be myths, they might be not myths. So I want you to say yes or no, right? Are they myths or not? Okay. The first one, weight training is bad for your joints and it makes you short or stunts your growth. So how many of you think this is true? Okay. So you can write true or false, yes or no, myth, not myth, whatever you want. Okay. So a bunch of people saying false, not myth, no. Okay. I'm glad we're all on the same page. Weight training is perfectly safe to do. You can start it at any age. Okay. The reason you say children shouldn't do it is because their joints are a little more flexible. So they might actually end up hurting themselves. Okay. That's all. Number two, creatine is a steroid and bad for you. Okay. Let's see how many of you think that's a myth versus that's a real. Okay. A lot of people saying it's false. Uh, love it. Absolutely. Creatine is not a steroid. Okay. And it's not really bad for you. It's pretty safely studied. What I would say is though, unless you're looking to sort of get into the professional bodybuilding space or be an athlete, I don't think it's very beneficial for the average gym goer, right? Not because it's not bad for you, just because it's expensive. Simple as that. Um, three, okay. Having giloy for diabetes, papaya leaf for platelets or dengue, and coronal for COVID-19. So effectiveness of all of these. Okay, what a bunch of people saying it's false or a myth. Absolutely, right? In fact, um, uh, coronal has recently been proven by the Supreme Court to have been false advertisement as well. Similarly, all these other cures, supposed cures, they don't actually work, right? Then the fourth one, 10,000 steps per day. Is it a myth or is it clear? Okay, I see. I think the first time people are saying true is for this one, okay? I like it, but unfortunately, 10,000 is kind of a myth, right? So the number 10,000 was chosen by a random Japanese speedometer company, right? And they said, if you have 10,000 steps, it means that you are healthy, okay? They randomly arbitrarily selected that number, right? 10,000. Um, but our data shows that walking 10,000 steps is not bad for you. It's great, right? If you want maximum benefit, between 12,500 to 13,000 steps gives you the maximum benefit. And uh, 16,000 is also good for you. It sort of plateaus after that, right? But again, just because you can't walk 16,000 steps doesn't mean you don't walk 10,000 steps. 10,000 is still a lot better than zero, right? Eight glass of water a day, is that a myth or not? Okay, I see a myth. Okay, a uh, bunch of people saying it's a myth. So yeah, uh, the whole point is that remove what we talked about from the start. You cannot predict what a uh, person needs. Right. If you need more than eight glasses, have more than eight glasses. If you don't need that much, don't have that much. When you're thirsty, please drink water. It's as simple as that. I would say if you want to quantify it, it's closer to two to three liters per day is a good idea. Right. It's an easy way to measure to just put one bottle of water on your table. And if you're filling it up two to three times a day, you know you're getting two to three liters. Okay. Carrots are good for your eyes. Is that a myth or not? Okay. Uh, I see people saying that it's true. Yeah, actually it is true. I mean, carrots are good for your eyes, but not to the extent you think, right? Because um, it, the origin for this is again, during World War II, um, the British pilots actually had access to radar, right? So when they had access to radar, the German pilots were trying to find out why the British pilots were so good. They had such great night vision. It was not night vision. It was actually radar. So the British spread the myth that because they ate carrots, their eyes were better. And that was sort of misinformation during World War II, right? So, yeah. Uh, vaccines can cause autism, COVID-19, things like that. Do you think it's a myth or not? Yeah, absolutely it's a myth, okay? Um, yeah, I think you guys have figured out that pretty much everything listed out here is a myth, right? So keep that in mind. Um, Try to avoid alternative medicine for acute diseases, right? There's a reason that if you've got a heart attack or if you've got 
a fracture, you don't really say, let me go to a homeopath or an Ayurvedic specialist because if it's an acute disease, you need access to real treatment in medicine, right? Um, yeah. So let's talk about the question answers. And just remember this. If something seems too good to be true, it probably is. Just, just always think from a cynical perspective when it comes to healthcare because it really helps. Right. So I'm going to go through the questions that you guys have posted. All right. All right. Okay. So the first question I see is, 